Hi, I'm Gary Horton, the author of Some Glad Morning, and it's my pleasure now to read to you uh, the opening chapter, chapter one. This is where we meet Ransom McTavish, the hero of our story. He's a 17-year-old son of a sharecropper in South Carolina. The year is uh, spring of 1918. He's dying, ain't he? The scrawny, bare-chested little girl said. I don't know. Ransom tucked a blue ledger book beneath his arm. He wore a dirty work shirt and trousers frayed beneath the knee. He had no shoes. His name is Mr. Evans, cause I found him at Mr. Evans' store, she said. The two looked down on a gray tabby kitten lying in the dust outside a sharecropper's shack. He didn't have no mama, so I brought him home. He's dying, ain't he? Maybe not. Ransom scooped the kitten up in both hands and felt the tiny rib cage rise and fall with each labored breath. Delicate clumps of sand stuck in a line of moisture along its lips. He could feel bones through the skin, and it weighed hardly anything at all. Ransom plucked the sand spur from the kitten's fur and gently brushed the sand from its lips. Although dirt subdued the gray tabby stripes, Mr. Evans had the markings of a dignified kitten. He had white boots and a white bib that spilled down from his chin and widened into a broad triangle across his chest. The kitten looked up to Ransom with trusting eyes. On the dirt road beyond the newly planted cotton, a shiny black model T puttered by, kicking up a cloud of red dust. A large sign mounted behind the driver read in bold letters, Join the Army Today. Yesterday the pig tried to eat him the little girl said, peering into Ransom's hands at the frail kitten. What are you feeding him? Nothing. Mama said he's got to catch his own dinner, but he won't do it. I reckon he's just going to starve himself to death. You have to feed him something till he's big enough to hunt. We can't feed the whole dang world, the little girl's mother said from the porch of the shack. The screen door slammed behind her as she leaned a shoulder against a porch post. A soiled dress hung loose on her frame. We can't hardly feed our own selves. She smoked a pipe made of clay bowl. She smoked a pipe made from a clay bowl Charlie Evans sold in his store for pennies. The stem was a hollow reed. She crossed her arms and propped a hand beneath the pipe. Smoke puffed from the corner of her mouth. You have to feed him something, Ransom said. Can't you give him a dab of butter? Butter? I wish. The woman said, You got butter at your house? Sometimes, Ransom said. He looked past the woman across the vast field of newly sprouted cotton plants to the shack where he lived. His father was marching through the fields towards them. How about some grease? You got any grease? A little, the woman said, puffing a wisp of smoke. Mama, we don't need much. Come in the house, pumpkin. The woman pushed away from the post. I'll get you a smidgen. When the little girl had run inside, Ransom looked out over the field. Except for a few oaks along the road and the woods along the creek where it stayed wet, the whole world was planted in cotton, right up to the Blue Ridge Mountains, rising in a haze against the sky. Spring cotton grew close to the shack with just enough room for a vegetable garden and a hog pen where a spindly peach tree offered the only shade. Every tillable square inch of South Carolina was planted in cotton, save for an occasional patch of corn grown to feed the men and mules. The little girl hurried from the shack, holding a spoon of congealed bacon fat in front of her. In the distance, between the two shacks, Ramson's father strode along a row of tender cotton plants, his shoulders hunched, his head bowed, which meant he was in a foul mood. He was always in a foul mood when he had to talk to the landlord, Mr. Jenkins. Make him eat it, Ransom, the girl said as she gave him the spoon of grease. He carried the kitten to the peach tree where he placed a blue ledger on the ground and sat holding the tiny burden in the shade. His back against the tree's narrow trunk. The girl knelt beside him. What's that book for? It's an account of what my daddy owes Mr. Jenkins. My daddy's recollection and Mr. Jenkins' recollection of how much my daddy owes for seed, fertilizer, and what all aren't the same. I'm keeping the record so my daddy can't get cheated. That's real smart, the little girl's mother said from the porch. With the pipe stem in her mouth, she leaned on the post. You learn that at the Baptist Mission School? Won't do you no good. 
Mr. Jenkins will find some other kind of way to cheat your daddy. That's why he lives so fat. He cheats people. Yes, ma'am. Ransom held the tiny... Ransom held the tin spoon with the dab of grease near the kitten's nose. Mr. Evans pressed closer. His tongue slipped out in a cautious taste and came alive in a flurry. When the grease was all lapped up, the kitten kept licking the spoon, and then Ransom felt the tiny, rough tongue licking his finger, too. Feed him bacon grease every day. He'll soon get strong enough to hunt on his own. I sort of hoped he'd die, the mother said. Be one less thing to worry about. He'll earn his keep, Ransom said. Once he's feeling better and a little bigger, he'll keep the mice out. Want me to get him some more? The little girl said, smiling up at Ransom. Not yet. Let his tummy rest. What else can I feed him? You just have to give it to him and see. I had a cat once that'll fight you for corn on the cob. The kitten curled in a ball in Ransom's lap, closed his eyes, and began to purr. Ransom rubbed the kitten's tiny neck and felt each bead-like bone. He picked sand spurs from the soft fur. When a spot of sunlight spilled into his lap, he held the sleeping kitten there for the sun to heal. He'll get better now, won't he? I think so. Ransom took a light brown nut from his pocket. As big as the end of his thumb, it looked like a large hazelnut. Here, he said, passing the nut to the little girl. Rub my lucky buckeye to be sure. She rubbed the nut between her palms and rubbed it some more. Boy, where the hell you been? Ransom's father walked out of the cotton field. You got the book? We got to have the book. Ransom passed the kitten to the girl, stood up, and showed the blue ledger to his father. What are you messing with kittens for? Ransom's father said. You're seventeen now. You need to put that sort of thing behind you and start acting like a man. Ransom followed his father through the cotton. The green plants were not yet knee-high. The two passed barefoot into the pecan grove surrounding Mr. Jenkins' white house. I dare that fat son of a bitch to cheat me now, his father said. Mr. Jenkins had the only painted house in that part of Pickens County. It glared white in the early morning sun. Mr. Jenkins had a telephone and electricity, too. Ransom had never been inside the house and had not seen the phone for himself, but at night... When he sat on the porch of their shack, he could see the electric lights glowing in the windows. The closer they got, the more he could feel the tension mounting in his father. He can't cheat us now, Ransom said. We got the numbers. He better not, his father said. They found Mr. Jenkins behind the house at the door of his commissary, where a hired man unloaded cases from the wooden bed of a Model T truck. Mr. Jenkins, round and soft-bellied, cocked a straw hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips as Ransom and his father came up the cinder drive. Mr. McTavish, he said, what do you want now? Cornmeal scratch and coffee. Against my better judgment, I credited you seed and fertilizer last month. That puts you more behind than you were already. You haven't come out ahead in three years. Ransom and his father stepped up to the Model T. The hired man kept his head bowed and continued to unload the truck. That's what I can't understand, Ransom's father said. Every year we pick more sacks off the fields I farm than any other place. And the price of cotton is higher now than it's ever been in my life. But I still can't come out ahead. Mr. Jenkins took his hat off and wiped the inside band with a handkerchief. Maybe you're not a, as good a farmer as you think. Numbers don't lie, and that's all I got to go on. Your numbers are steady marching backwards. You need cash money if you want to come out ahead. We don't have cash money, his father said, but my boy knows numbers as good as you. We got our own book now. He drew Ransom up closer. Show him the book. Your book doesn't mean a thing here, Mr. Jenkins said. The commissary book is the only book that matters. He turned his back and went into the weathered barn made of rough sawmill lumber. The hired man stacked wooden crates inside the door and refused to make eye contact with any of them. A single bare light bulb hung from the ceiling and cast a sickly yellow glow on the shelves of work clothes, hardware, and foodstuff. Hundred-pound sacks of cornmeal and scratch feed stood upright, all but choking the middle aisle. At the counter, below the empty scales, shiny tin pails of lard were stacked three high. 
an open keg of roasted coffee beans filled the place with a rich aroma. Mr. Jenkins picked a single bean from the keg and popped it into his mouth. Sucking loudly on the coffee bean, he opened the commissary ledger book and spread it wide on the counter. Ransom, his father said, get up here and look at these figures. Ransom studied the numbers. Mr. Jenkins had written in his father's account. He opened his own ledger book and compared. What's this? He pressed a dirt-stained finger at the bottom of a column in Mr. Jenkins' book. We don't have those numbers. Where'd they come from? You know, Mr. Jenkins said, I was against the Baptist Missionary School coming here to teach you kids how to read and write and figure. I, I knew it would only lead to misunderstanding. A little education is a dangerous thing. It can make for hard feelings. If you had as much education as I do, you'd know straight away what those numbers mean. It's not my job to educate you. I'm just trying to make a living, same as anybody else. I own the land you farm. I own the house you live in. I even credit you what you need. But, Mr. McTavish, you have continually tried to take advantage of my generosity. What is it? Ransom, what's he trying to pull? The cords in his father's neck grew tight. His cheeks flushed red. The muscles stretched across his jaw, flexed in hard knots. He added three dollars to last month's numbers, Ransom said. It's a surcharge on the balance you owe. Long as you owe me, I can add a surcharge. That's the law. It might be the law, but it ain't decent. Anger charged the air. Ransom grabbed his father by the waist and tried to turn him around. You're already taking everything I got, his father said, leaning across the counter. You ain't got to cheat me, too. Daddy, Ransom tried to pull him away. Daddy, come on, let's go. Are you calling me a cheat, Mr. Jenkins said. Keep pushing me, and I just might forget my Christian principles. Daddy, Ransom tried to pry his father from the counter. We got cotton in the ground. We can't start over, not this year. Think about that. You don't like it here? The hired man passed a double-barrel shotgun to Mr. Jenkins, who raised it over the counter. Ransom's father took a step back. You got cotton in the ground. I can have you out and get a new man in there by the end of the day. I'll give your place to a colored family. They won't complain like you. We like it fine, Ransom said, pulling his father toward the door, his eyes fixed on the shotgun. We like it fine. With his finger on the trigger, Mr. Jenkins watched Ransom and his father backing out the door. He laid the shotgun barrel across the counter so the muzzle aimed belly high. Ransom felt it in his gut.